The top story today making news headlines, fog in Nebraska. No, I'm just kidding. It is Tropical Storm Nicole approaching the Florida coast. At the time we record this, it is a tropical storm. We're waiting on the update, which will be coming out in about 30 minutes, and we could be up to hurricane strength. And there's a look at the infrared imagery. Clearly, no well-defined eye. It is a convective cluster, and it is pushing towards the Florida coast. Should be there this evening. Let's take a look at the radar and see what we can see. The center of the storm is slightly out of range, but we can see the convective bands working on shore, not very organized. The main cluster obviously right out here, and there could be more further out, but we're not going to really know that for another few hours. So let's head into that surface map. There's Tropical Storm Nicole soon to be a hurricane, and up to the north, a very strong ridge. This is an outgoing polar air mass centered over the northeastern U.S. You can see those rather cool temperatures, and especially the dew points. Dew points are mostly in the 20s, so a vast amount of dry air in place. And that will be a factor over the next couple of days as the storm recurves to the north. In the western U.S., yeah, look at that. Many, many colors. That's reflecting a fairly diverse variety of precipitation. Also some fog out there in the northern plains. A little bit of freezing rain in South Dakota. And blizzard warnings are up for an area from the Dakotas up to northern Minnesota. And we're also expecting significant freezing rain to develop a little bit south of that track. In the southwestern U.S., a strong Pacific system moving into the Four Corners area. Cold front has just passed Phoenix. Looks like we're still looking at southwesterly winds in Tucson and Safford, so that's going to be part of the warm sector. And with this being a classic Anna front, precipitation will follow the cold front, and the big factor for this evening is going to be wind. And there's going to be a lot of that with that strong pressure gradient. At this time... Gusts are up to about 28 knots around, I think that's going to be Prescott. We'll take a closer look at those gusts in just a little bit. And then further back towards the thermal trough, snow showers due to the steep lapse rates. And you can see a fairly large area connecting back up into this area of isentropic lift in Montana. That's going to be that overrunning. The flow is slightly out of the east. If you remember that the surface lows in a bear clinic system tend to stack towards the cold air with height, that means that the mid-level low is going to be right around here and the upper level low somewhere back here. It may not be an upper level low, it could be a trough, but the general principle is the same. And that means in the mid-levels, you're going to have this system trying to pull moisture northwest over the frontal system, and that's where you get those cold conveyor belts feeding into the back of these winter weather systems. And that's helping to support some of that precipitation back in Montana. Let's take a look up in Alaska. Cold weather. Temperatures below zero in Alberta. Yeah, look at that. The zero line located from just south of Banff National Park down to about Cut Bank and then back up towards Saskatoon. And temperatures are as low as minus 8 out around Calgary. Going further north, plenty of cold air. And let's see, 1024 millibar high across Yukon. That very dense cold air that we talked about on Monday with a 1040 millibar high. That's dispersed to the southeast. And you're seeing that right down in this region. And that's being replaced with more southerly flow working up into Alaska. So lots of clouds and precipitation. And you can see those temperatures already up to about 30 degrees in the interior regions of Alaska. And then a quick look out there in Canada. Not much going on. Just a lot of cold weather. Down as low as minus 15, minus 13 in the Arctic regions. And then we've got this outgoing Hudson Bay storm. You can see that the temperatures are fairly mild, 
25 to 30 degrees, pretty common. So a little bit of rain mixed in down in James Bay. And then circling back to the south, well, we find a frontal wave there in Minnesota. Rain and fog along with that. There's the Pacific system, the polar air intrusion, and out ahead of it, a fairly stout supply of warm air. This is some pretty significant moisture. You can see the dew points are up to 60 in Iowa, and we pick up 50s in Minnesota and Wisconsin. And here's what we're talking about. These cyan colors are precipitable waters of over one inch. So that's going to be a good supply of moisture coming north. And bringing that forward, you're going to see these pressure falls develop a frontal system in the Great Plains. There it comes, pushing into that moisture, and we're looking at some severe weather potential in the upper Mississippi River Valley for tomorrow. And then, of course, we see that other atmospheric river get started coming up behind Tropical Storm or Hurricane Nicole, and you can see that surge north into the northeastern U.S., Fortunately, everything is pretty fast moving, but that will help generate some significant precipitation. And then after the weekend, significant drying, but our focus will be down on the western Gulf Coast for Monday as a new weather system picks up the tail end of that front and moves into the northeastern U.S. Okay, let's take a look at a dynamical model. This is the high-resolution rapid refresh displayed using AWIPS, which is the same system used in National Weather Service forecast offices. So we run this forward. You're looking at a plot of pressure with the isobars every one millibar. Also the wind field. That's going to be these barbs right here. And then we also have in colored shading. That's going to be the wind gusts not the sustained winds, but the actual wind gusts. So that will give you worst case numbers, the scale up here at the very top, that's going to be in knots. So as you get into greens, that's going to be 55 knots, about 65 miles an hour, and your reds are going to be 70 knot gusts, which are near 80 miles an hour. So what we see here starting out at uh, 4 p.m., the main wind field still well offshore. The Light blue colors indicating 45 knot gusts starting to approach the coastal regions. And then we run that forward. You can see the higher winds starting to work towards the Vero Beach and Port St. Lucie area. Let's zoom in for a closer look. There you go. So we're up to 3 Zulu, which is going to be about 10 p.m. Eastern. And those higher winds heading straight into the Vero Beach area. The reds indicating gusts up near 80 miles an hour. Again, those are gusts and not sustained winds. And with those wind-driven waves, we're going to get that coastal flooding focusing on this area right here. The brunt of it right around Vero Beach, maybe slightly to the south. And then going forward to about 1 a.m., the storm starting to cross onto the coast. And we get those frictional effects start to take over, and that tends to tear up the storm. The wind velocity goes down, but the precipitation still will be there. Let's look at that precipitation. Let me zoom back out. And there you go. It looks a little bit like radar, but this is model-derived precipitation rainfall rate. And there it goes. Heavy precipitation field approaching the coast, moving on shore about 11 p.m. Eastern, and that heavy rain area is going to focus pretty much in that same region from Vera Beach up towards Orlando and then wrapping around down towards Lake Okeechobee. So let's take a look at the forecast in terms of dynamics and fronts and air masses. You can see Nicole down there approaching the Florida coast. Also, there's that ridging in the northeastern U.S. we talked about earlier and fronts in the Four Corners area. You can see that thickness gradient right there. Actually, this is potential temperature. So this is basically temperature like isobar or isotherms reduced down towards a common level. And we see the cold front running about like that. The polar front up to the north, the Canadian front running about like that. 
And that's pretty much what we're going to watch as we roll this forward. So into tomorrow morning, there you go. You can see that northern system becomes dominant up there in the northern plains. That's it. Warm front and the remains of Nicole crossing over just north of Tampa. Going into tomorrow evening, well, we're probably going to see a thunderstorm outbreak there in Iowa, Illinois, Wisconsin. So that'll be an area to watch right along that cold front, which is surging south through the central plains, already down towards the Oklahoma City area, and then arcing back up as a sort of stationary front along the Continental Divide region. We've lost definition of the Pacific front. I really don't know where it is. I think it probably kind of crossed over like that. Yeah, it looks like that southern stream lost definition. So going into Thursday evening and into Friday morning, the cold front working down into Arkansas, down towards Dallas, and down to Midland. So gusty north winds through that area. You can see there's also pressure rises out there in the Great Basin area, the Rockies, and that's going to be kind of a cold, high-pressure region going into Friday afternoon. The main wave lifts up into Canada, and it leaves us with this tail end front all the way down towards the Gulf, ridging all the way down into Texas and Louisiana and Arkansas. And you can see the core of that cold air right there over North Dakota. And then going into the weekend, cold polar high dominates much of the eastern U.S., and then we see the development of a gulf system. Got to pan south to catch that, but that's it right there around Mobile. That's going to be Tuesday morning. Frontal boundary kind of like that. Low pressure area. And that lifts up into the northeastern U.S. And let's run that one more time with the precipitation overlay. That wet system crossing Florida and starting to recurve up to the north. Lots of rain in Alabama and Georgia, and that'll spread up into the Appalachians, especially around West Virginia, southeastern Ohio, western Pennsylvania, and upstate New York. So that's going to affect those regions Thursday going into Friday. And there's the damage, the seven-day precipitation totals. Doesn't really look too bad. Mostly a lot of dark reds all the way up into the Appalachians, which is indicating two to three inches. So we're looking at about three to five in Florida, and then two to three inches on average up through the Appalachians. It's a combination of progressive movement of that tropical system, and also the entrainment of fairly substantial amount of dry air as it heads westward and then up to the north. And before we close things out, let's take a look at the temperature extremes. This is this afternoon, certainly a warm day from the Texarkana region up to St. Louis and into the Omaha area. Lots of 70s and 80s. And that warm weather heads up to the northeast for tomorrow. We're going to have that front coming south through the central plains, warm front lifting north, and that puts this area in the warm sector. So up to 72 at Madison breaking the record by 5 degrees for the date. And on the backside, plenty of cold air developing in the Great Basin area, down to 2 degrees at Burns, and 4 at LLJ, what is that, low-level jet? I don't know, some station up there northeast of Boise. For Friday, the cold air surges south into the plains, but no records really back behind it where we have the strong radiational cooling in the Great Basin area. Temperatures plummet down to zero at Ely, 15 at Ontario, Idaho, and minus two at, we'll just call it low-level jet, Idaho. I don't know what that place is. And on the East Coast, 70 in the New York City area. And then on Saturday, quite warm with that atmospheric river heading into the northeastern U.S. Moisture and warmth bringing temperatures up near 70 degrees. For Sunday, things moderate, much of the country returning to seasonal normals. Same thing on Monday, and again on Tuesday. 
but it's worth pointing out we could be heading into kind of a cold weather pattern for next week. I've got the 850 millibar temperatures. This is a good product for looking at Arctic air masses. You can see all that cold air up there in western Canada and bringing that forward. The Arctic air surges down into Nebraska and Wyoming for tomorrow and then wraps around down into Iowa and Wisconsin for Friday. But further west, some residual cold air and also strong radiational cooling setting in, which will help support those high pressures in that area. And let's see, going into Sunday and Monday next week, there it is. There's a second shot developing. You can see that northwesterly flow in through Rapid City, Miles City, Sunday into Monday, and surging southward into the High Plains. And this has taken kind of an unusual south and southwestward track towards Amarillo. So we're looking at Monday and Tuesday. And some strong cyclogenesis there. That's going to be tied to that surface system that we talked about on the Gulf Coast. And that stacks up towards the cold air. You see it here at 850. And at 700 and 500, it's probably further to the northwest. So that will slingshot in some cold air on the backside. Tuesday, Wednesday, and look at that, another surge coming down. This is only 180 hours out, so this is probably going to be in the ballpark of being accurate. And you can see temperatures up there, minus 20 at 850, which is some very frigid air. That surges straight south. And it looks like some of it crosses the Continental Divide and some of the passes. I can see it kind of oozing southwestward a bit. And looks like a strong system there in Nevada. So we've probably got a trough out here, and that's going to kind of put the brakes on the southward progress of that cold air. Yeah, it's hard to tell what's going on with just this one chart. Either the wave has progressed eastward very rapidly, or there's just a strong volume of cold air coming down through the central U.S. But those cold 850 millibar temperatures do head into Texas for the 21st. Getting up to Thanksgiving here, you can see this vast area of cold air up to the north, the polar vortex, centered on Hudson Bay. And that will put the northeastern quarter of the country in the deep freeze. Some moderation by the 22nd. Well, this is getting out into fantasy land, but downslope warming. And then it looks like another surge. And the fact that showing all this cold air production is indicating that we're probably back in a positive P&A pattern and a period of strong northwesterly flow. And that's all for this edition of Forecast Lab. Just as a reminder, we do need your Patreon support. We've only had one new Patreon subscriber since October 5th, and that's Travis. I am currently working on a draft of the new North American forecasting book. I haven't mentioned anything about this, but it is being worked on. That's just one draft page right there. And I do have to drop all that work to do these videos during the afternoon. And like many of you, I have bills to pay. So it is very important to have your support for this video. And although we brought Travis on board, we did lose three supporters due to expired subscriptions. So we're actually down in the red. And it is a little bit demoralizing to not have that support there. So if you find this program useful, please help support the Forecast Live program. I do appreciate it. And for those of you who are supporting, I thank you very much. You are the core, the nucleus of this program. Anyway, we'll see you all again here on Friday. Hope you have a good Wednesday night, and we'll see you in a couple days. Bye-bye.